Good morning, merhaba. It's really great to be here. I love Istanbul and uh, I've been working in telecom uh, related businesses for the last 12 years as a futurist. Uh, many of you probably don't know what a futurist is. Anybody know what a futurist is? <laughs> okay. A futurist is somebody who's looking forward the next five to ten years and then working backwards to reinvent what people do. There's famous futurists like Alvin Toffler that you may know from the history of futurism and there's also people like Ray Kurzweil who are infamous for their futurism. My work is very much focused on the next five to seven years and the key question really is what is going to happen in five to seven years that will help you reinvent your business today. And uh, when I was preparing for this event, one thing that is for certain, of course, is that risk will increase. Right. <laughs> That's probably not new to you, but given that everything in technology is now exponentially faster and bigger, some of the things that we're seeing every single day, they look like science fiction. Uh, if you look at movies like Minority Report, Blade Runner, uh, Oblivion, you know, some of those things in those movies are actually real now. For example, real-time language translation is here. You can use an app called Say Hi. Do you remember? You may have tried that sometime. It's $2 for this app, right? It's very powerful. You can speak in real time and have it come out in uh, 24 languages in real time and the other way around. This is true science fiction. The other day I was in Japan ordering sushi. I was speaking in German. She heard it in Japanese. She responded in Japanese. I heard it in German in real time. Okay. Then there's things like uh, big data, artificial intelligence. You know, almost every single web product that we use, from Google Maps to Google Now to, uh, of course, Amazon, Netflix, has artificial intelligence in it, which means it emulates what people used to do. I'll give you some great examples on this, the way things are going. So my job really is, this expresses my job very easily. I take very complex scenarios and I bring them down to the, hello? It's not working, okay. I have to go back to the old-fashioned way of hitting the button, I guess. Nope. Sorry about that. We tried this earlier, there you go. Okay, so bringing complex things down to the bottom line. And of course, you know the telecom business is pretty complex. About one third of my work is in telecom, working with carriers and technology companies, and the other one is media, marketing, and tourism, a few other key terms. Um, my company is called the Futures Agency, and our motto is, it wasn't raining before Noah, when Noah built the ark. And this is something that we use a lot to talk to people, because when you're doing well, it's actually a good time to think about the future. You know, when I worked in the music business, I used to be a musician and producer, and la later on on the internet. I worked with the record labels 1999 to say, you know, the music is going to move into the cloud. And music will be just a click on a button and then you get music. And in 1999, they said that this is, it may be true, but we don't like this. Right? We don't like the idea of technology doing this, right? So they refused, and what do we have today? We have 71% decline on revenues in music, yeah? because it happened anyway. So we're going to take a couple live polls, and I, I assure you that the internet here is not working very well. Uh, I'm sure you've tried. So if you have 3G and you can roam, then it's better, better off if you're using that. We're doing some live polls, and you have, all you have to do is go to this web page if you have a smartphone paulev.com slash futuristgerd. We're not doing a poll now, this is just for a heads up, okay? But I, uh, on this system, I have 250 slots for voting, so if I only see 14 people voting, then I know you haven't voted, and you know, what happens if you don't vote? You don't get lunch. Yeah? Anyway, so we have rapid digital transformation in all sectors of society. Right. Worldwide, really. And it's interesting to see that the so-called developing countries are taking the lead, actually, on some of these changes. And some of the business models I'll talk about are actually perfectly suited for developing countries rather than developed countries. This transformation is things like, 
Imagine you have a bookstore. Right? Today, if you have a bookstore, people come to your bookstore, they look at the book, and they scan the code with their phone. Then they go to Amazon, where the book is three times as, as cheap. So rather in Switzerland, you go to the bookstore, it's 40 Swiss francs, like 30 euros. You go to Amazon in the store and order it for 6 euros. Okay. And that is pretty much happening everywhere. Now in many restaurants that you go to, the waitress has been replaced by an iPad. Okay. So this is actually a big trend in restaurants. You fire half of the waiters, you use an iPad to order, and the other people bring in the food. You shortcut this. The Google self-driving car, you familiar with a self-driving car? It's going to be a while before it gets real. But assisted driving, for example, driving on a highway in a chain of cars, that's already becoming reality. So rapid transformation, starting with the original World Wide Web, 1984, of course. Now, this is a major driver of change called big data. I'm sure you're familiar with that. But big data basically means, today means, that we have a huge growth of data, but we're only using like 0.05% of this intelligence in the data. Okay. And that is will be a major driver of business models. Google, Facebook, Amazon, those are companies that are essentially like oil companies for data. Right. You've heard the saying before in 2006, uh, data is the big oil, this is the new oil. Right. And that's actually true now. The data economy will be more than the fossil fuel, the oil economy, in, the, in seven years. Roughly eight trillion dollars per year. The Internet of Things, that's the other big change. Connecting cars, traffic lights, transportation, logistics, our wristwatches, connecting everything with everyone. Also a very scary proposal when you think about what that means. Right? Potentially uh, overlaps privacy issues. And this is the most important issue for you, right? is data intelligence. What can the system do that used to be done by people or by simple software by truly becoming intelligent? You know, there's research now from Oxford from last year already that says in the next 20 years, we're going to have most things automated and digitized. Anything that can be automated will be. Right? For example, advertising programmatic advertising, manufacturing. We can lose as many as 45% of all jobs due to automation. So if you're doing revenue assurance today or you're figuring out how to use software in the future, this will be done with a digital brain, so to speak. Or well, it's already done with a digital brain, right? But in the future, this brain will be actually intelligent. You can get a preview of this if you go uh, to your app on your mobile phone and bring up the app. It's called Google Now. It's pretty much on every mobile phone. If you're a Google user, you log in and Google Now will tell you what's going to happen for the rest of the day. Your weather, your stock, your friends, the places you should eat, and so on. It's basically predicting things. So this is a, a very big trend for the near future. So what's happening here, most of you are operators and from, the, from a telecom business, of course, is that this is a gigantic opportunity for a leap you know, from this old place, the water glass of mobile operators, to a new fishbowl. And also that means entirely new revenue models based on social, local, mobile, cloud video, big data. And if you look around, you know, many of the major international telecoms are making that leap at the very moment trying to figure out how to become part of something that is going on on top of the networks. And this is a very tough change because it's basically like a transformation from, you know, from a car to a robot, like this short clip shows. Right? So it's actually quite a challenge to figure this out. And, and one of the things is that our entire business logic, our models, our ecosystem, our intelligence, is sort of swept away by this wave of new things that are happening. The Internet of Things, for example, some companies like Cisco and others are saying it could be 50 times as large as the Internet of People and Computers. And of course, all of these things use the network. For example, if you're in the entertainment business, music, films, news, video, and books are in the cloud now. 
So what happens when you don't have the cloud? You have nothing. Right? You, you can't do anything. When the Google car drives and it does not have a connection of one gig per second to download data, it will stop driving. In fact, the Google car will not let you out of the car if it doesn't have a data connection. Because right? nothing works anymore. So dependency on the network will be absolutely fundamental. And this brings up interesting opportunities. I think what's happening here is that if we look at the old model of mobile operators and telecoms, that's actually a very small pie compared to the future. Having said that, of course, here's the bad part. Right? This is not just your pie. There'll be many other people sitting in that pie, including companies that build artificial intelligence like Google. Google is planning to basically take over advertising with an algorithm. You know, the advertising business is roughly $1 trillion per year. And if technology goes on as it is now, very soon half of that will be automated, right? especially mobile advertising. So the challenge really is we're living in an exponential world. Okay? And an exponential world means that connectivity and technology is taken off. Right? It's basically we're at this point here roughly around here. Interesting, if you count linear numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? it's almost the same than 1, 2, 4, 8. You know, it's not so far apart. But from 8 to, to 16 is a big leap. From 4 to 5 is not. So an exponential world means that all the things that we've been looking at, suddenly they happen. Right? Cheap batteries for self-driving cars, bioengineering, all of the things that are happening on the scale just absolutely explode. And the bad part is, of course, that people, or, or the good part, you could say in many ways, people, culture, regulations, and politics are like a snail compared to exponential technology. There's good things and bad things about this because people can't be exponential. You know, people, we don't think faster because we Twitter. You know? So our brain is limited there. But we're living in a world that's this is the rule number one. You can, you can expect exponential change in the next five years. And that also means exponential speed of change. If you look what happened in a very short time, for example, Apple and Amazon, 50% of their revenues come from things that didn't even exist five to six years ago, the Kindle and the iPhone. And that's going to happen to you as well. So by 2020, it's a good chance, maybe 20, 30, 50% of your revenues come from new things. What will they be? Can you afford to sit back and say, oh, you know, we'll continue as usual, because it still makes lots of money. Right? People are still buying connectivity, making phone calls. My view is you can't. Because if you don't add the new revenue streams, somebody else will take them over and start eating into your core revenue streams. It's a great book to read on this called Exponential Organizations. This just came out from a Singularity University, and they described the process of how you can become exponential. So I, I recommend that you read this, because that is rule number one. We have to think exponentially, because now we have these convergences. And if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. A for a 15-year-old kid, the internet and getting online is like electricity. It's like water. It's like going to the bathroom. Right? There's no doubt it exists. You know, the other day I went to Zanzibar with my 18-year-old son, and this was the first time in his life that he didn't have internet. Right? So we're on the beach, and he wants to go and listen to music. Of course, doesn't work, right? <laughs> no internet. <laughs> so basically, this convergence of on and offline is happening, the convergence of human and machines. I mean, Google Glass, for example, augmented reality, turns us into a cyborg, basically. Right? I don't know if you tried Google Glass, but I'm not wearing Google Glass now, don't worry. But if I was, I could pull up information from Wikipedia while I speak. Right? And the doctor wearing Google Glass can see all the cancer records of every patient in the hospital in real time, right? turning us into superhumans. That's a scary thought. 
Because your next step, you know what the next step is, right? No glasses, but a contact lens that does the same thing, and the next step after that is an implant. And this is not science fiction. The Internet of Things has the potential to solve huge global problems like global warming. Because if we connect everything, for example, heating systems, transportation, logistics, we can save up to 40-50% of energy. Uh, Procter & Gamble and Unilever have calculated that if they connected everything in their containers in the entire process, they can save half the cost of shipping. But they would have to collaborate uh, to make that work, which is probably not going to happen. In entertainment, you know what's, ha what's happening in entertainment, right? We're going from a broadcast world to a broadband world. I mean, I can give you 500 euros for a person in Germany, a person under 30, that watches regular television. I mean, we watch television like this, you know, or we watch over the top, but kids, they just go to the internet to watch television. This is the same thing. YouTube is television, right? Hulu, Netflix, iPlayer. In this world, as a mobile operator, this is fantastic for you, right? Because the less broadcasting, the more broadbanding, I call this broad, the better. Right? And of course, they are overlapping. Broadcast is not going away. Lots of opportunities here. Okay, let's talk about one painful part. You know, I'm, I'm originally from Germany, so I give you some pain occasionally. Um, the question about being digitally contestable. That means, can somebody invent some software or something else that will compete with what you're doing? Okay. Give you one example, the entertainment business, DVDs. Has anybody, any of you purchased a DVD sometime this year? Anybody? Yeah? Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Last year, I gave a DVD to my 25-year-old son with a movie. He thought I should go see a therapist. Right? Because you know you can watch movies anywhere, anytime. Right? But a DVD is like it's like having a uh, you know an old-fashioned old-timer rather than a real car. Look what happens to those people. Your DVD used to cost twenty-five dollars. Now it's all streaming for ten dollars a month for a million movies. So the margin per unit has gone down ninety-nine percent, basically. Books, same thing. Here you have HBO, which is cable in America, and Netflix, which is over the top, beating HBO. Two weeks ago, HBO announced they're going to go and do streaming as well without cable. So those are examples for digitally contestable businesses. And you know these guys, right? Of course you know these guys. Everybody in the world is using WhatsApp, basically, right? And you know what's happening there is that this is a bad, big problem for SMS, of course. Sooner or later for talking, I think that should be about half a year, video, broadcasting. Right. So the telecom business is clearly digitally contestable. Right. I mean, it's many things that cannot be contested, like you need a network for this to work. <laughs> hard to contest that, but what happens on the network is contestable. We're moving into a future that is completely visual. 80% right? of internet traffic by 2020 will be video and visual media. Right? It's interactive, immersive, intelligent, and most of it is mobile. So it's a whole new thing happening. For example, this company down here, it's called Magic Leap is inventing how we're going to watch TV by being 3D and virtual reality on a regular television. And they are inventing a technology where you can see things like this, superimposed over real-time things. Uh, Google just invested $500 million in the company. So what happens here is that uh, mobile devices are becoming like rocket ships for our brain. I mean, we can do stuff with mobiles that we could never do with our brain like remember everything. 
you know, move stuff around. Like it's like an outside brain. This is a uh, clip called uh, iBeacon, an application where you can go into a store and the store recognizes who you are and gives you the things that you're looking for with a beacon, guides you directly to the table where they are. Very popular in fashion stores, Apple stores, of course. So this is essentially like becoming our external eyes and ears. Because nothing could be better for a mobile company than this. Right? I mean, clearly this is addictive. Google calls this screenification. Everything is becoming a screen. Our movies, our books, our maps, everything is a screen. I mean, if you go the other day, three weeks ago I was in Hong Kong, I looked at the front of the car, the guy I was driving with, he had eight screens on the windshield. Huh? Facebook, maps, all the other stuff. You know? Mind-boggling. Screenification, that's happening all over the world. And all of a sudden, the digital native, you know, digital natives are hard to say, between, say, 15 and 30, roughly, the YouTube generation. And they're actually getting much older now. In five years, 50-year-old people will be digital natives, basically. Happening very quickly. Everything is becoming liquid. They expect everything to be liquid. Liquid service, liquid communications, liquid media, liquid money. If you're not liquid, they don't even want to hear about you. Music is YouTube, and books is e-books. Reserving a restaurant is open table or TripAdvisor or whatever, it's completely liquid. The problem for you is that in this process, they expect you to become liquid. Mobile operators. Lower prices, better service. And you know where this leads to the need to create other services that you can give them. Right? Because there's a limit to how liquid you can be, which means quality versus price. Right? So your risk goes up substantially. Wearable computing. I'm not sure I would wear a smartwatch, but it, it appears to be quite a hot trend to monitor yourself. This is definitely a big trend that we're going to see in the next few years, how interfaces are changing. Okay. Do you know that we're just about to switch to computing with talking? It already works just fine on the mobile phone, but on the Apple, for example, I dictate all of my emails now. I use the Chrome, the Chrome browser from Google, you can dictate right into it. So when I search now, I don't type anymore, I just speak. Right? And in two or three years, it becomes a standard. We don't type anymore. We dictate emails, we use Dragon, whatever software for those kind of things. We touch the screen, right? You know the scene from Minority Report where he goes in to fetch the data like this, right? That's going to be our reality. So technology is going inside. Technology is becoming invisible, basically. If you use Siri on the iPhone and you ask Siri about the weather, the weather information isn't saved in, in the box, right? It's in the cloud. And that is becoming essentially the mode of operation for everything, for predicting stuff, right? Predictive analysis, sentiment reporting, you know, all these things that sound like, like voodoo, right? They're becoming real now. In fact, Google has said that they can predict the stock market of tomorrow, the next day, using Google information. And they have chosen not to work on this project because it's, it's a difficult question whether you should, right? But they have enough real-time information about stocks to predict what's it going to look like tomorrow. Not hard to do. Well, they're hard to do, but they have it. Right? The great book to read on this is called The Second Machine Age. It's talking about how robotics are taken over, and this is all very relevant for mobile, because what's happening is that we're working on this overlap of mach machine and human, which, after all, mobile devices are machines. Now we're getting to the age of thinking machines. Right? IBM Watson is a machine that actually has artificial intelligence, and what they're trying to get to is artificial general intelligence, which allows IBM Watson not to play chess, but to answer important questions or to understand a joke. I would, that would be a strange thing. The, uh, IBM Watson already won Jeopardy, which is a complicated game. Right? It's not just Wikipedia. Uh, 
So, and that's going to be in all mobile devices. I'm going to have access to this intelligence through the cloud. This is a cover of Economist magazine a few months ago. And this is very relevant for your business because guess what? These machines are going to do a lot of the jobs that you currently are doing or working on with some of your software. It's a great opportunity also to build them, of course, digital helpers, assistants, smart software agents. For example, if you're a bank, a lot of you work with your clients about, you know, basically not getting loans, but financial information. Now you can go and use a software called Narrative Science, and you can tell the software, I want to invest in the pharma business, what do you recommend? 14 seconds later, you have a 200-page report. Okay. Because the software has pulled all this stuff together, all this information that a human never could. And yes, it's not creative, obviously. It's fact-driven. A narrative science, a software company, writes 20% of Forbes magazine is written by a robot. I don't know if you noticed, you know, it sounds robotic to me anyway sometimes, but that's already happening. So you can expect intelligent software agents and data robots will dramatically change the way that mobile services are delivered. And that's where all the startups are coming from. And by the way, we're going to distribute the slides later as a PDF, so there's quite a few here. So that's kind of a general trend. Again, from The Economist, a really interesting variation of, this, of the same theme is like all of a sudden we can surf on this wave of really intelligent data. Did you know that most companies, they save data, of course, telcos and operators save lots of data, but none of that is actually used in a meaningful way. 0.05% in the average. Companies like Google, that's all they do. Right? Derive intelligence. I mean, the numbers are staggering. This guy says the combination of big data and smart machines will take over some occupations wholesale, and others it will allow firms to do more with fewer workers. That is the future of software. So rapid automation of business processes is certain. And I, I call this sometimes, you know, hyper-efficiency. There's great potential here, and then there is, of course, challenges because it can be done by other players. Um, if you're looking, for example, what's happening in the newspaper business, right, this is a slide about the future of newspapers. Right. Basically, what's happening here is that a lot of people have different reasons to buy different things as far as publishing and magazines is concerned. For example, here on the left, you have The Economist, which I subscribe to, and The Economist allows you to listen to the magazine. Right? So, and this is real people voice, not computer voice. So the only reason I subscribe to The Economist is because I can listen to it in the car. And that is the added value. So as a telecom company, you, ha you have to start thinking about how much added values can you supply to your customers. Some of it for free, some of it not for free. And that is sort of the mission of what we're trying to figure out for the future. Because now you have this scenario in the next five to seven years. All of the things that have been discussed for the last five years are suddenly here, right? Analytics, Internet of Things, robotics, 3D printing, smart homes, genomics, connected healthcare. I mean, you have to be a professor to understand all of this stuff, right? It's mind-boggling. I mean, you could spend all of your time just looking at these trends. You wouldn't get any work done. So this has huge impact on all of this and, of course, on OSS as well. The future really is this, right? You used to be here, communications and ICT, right? and all the other guys were somewhere else. The other industries, now they're all converging. Learning, education, entertainment, content, transactions, commerce, money, health, right? all converging together. I know this puts the fear of God into many operators. Yeah. Because, you know, when you did this by yourself, it was a pretty straightforward business model. The future is not going to be as straightforward. Because yeah. in a converged future, you're not in charge. These are ecosystems. Yeah. So basically what that means is amazing opportunities 
and the challenges. On the one side, I call this Telco 1.0, right? the, the business that's just kind of ending. And over here on the other side, telecom, media, things, money, work, and health, right? It's going like this. Now I can promise you 99% of all mobile companies in the world, you stay on the left stream, you're dead. It's okay? my view. Because all the action will move over here and the new revenue streams are over here. There's still plenty of revenue streams over here, clearly. And you can make that choice, and maybe you don't have a chance. You, know. you don't have a choice in, in some highly regulated countries. It would be difficult to not do that. Right? But most of the action is moving over here. So let's do a poll. You can take out your device. This is the time to show that you are a geek. Okay. But take them out, it's okay. Take out your weapons. As I said, this is not optional. If you don't do this, then basically you don't get lunch. Okay, this is real time, okay? The question is really simple. Do you believe that mobile operators really need to move into adjacent business areas, such as content, money, health, or risk decline in relevance? Simple question. All you have to do is go to the website, polev.com slash futuristgert. Okay, if you don't want to go to a website, you can send them SMS. If you have a dumb phone, yeah, any of you have a dumb phone? Right? You know, like an old fashioned, who are they again? Nokia, right. right. Uh, you can text the code to this phone number using one of these short codes, okay? Or if you're hip and you're Twitter, just send a tweet to add poll with the code of the answer. Uh, but by far the easiest is to use the website, pollev.com slash futurist Gert. It's active, right? You can see it? Hello? Yes? <laughs> I realize this is very early, but... Yeah. Huh? Don't log in. Just go to pollev.com slash futurist Gert. There's a login option. Just ignore it. See, it seems to work. We do have responses here. Now, if you don't respond, your wishes will be ignored, clearly. Okay, there we go. That's good. You're finally getting it, right? You're, you can be ready for the future. <laughs> okay. Everybody know how this works, yeah? Okay. Again, the simplest way, if you don't want to go on the web, send an SMS to this number. Okay? And use one of the short codes here. A little bit hard to see the short code now for some reason. Okay, you guys are still voting, yeah? That's good. This is anonymous, of course. You're not, uh, I'm going to save your phone number and send it to your boss what, what you voted on. I'm just kidding. Anyway, so we'll, we'll keep it here. We have an interesting response. That's good. I think you guys are with me for the most part. You think absolutely that you need to move on to adjacent business areas, and there's quite a few people saying, yes, well, I figured you would say this. Yeah. But it's interesting, but it seems uncertain. Well, that, that is definitely the case. But an interesting mix. You know, we seem to have quite a few optimists here, which is good. Let me go back to the position. You can keep voting. It's going to keep running until I switch the next one on. All right, so here are some challenge opportunities from operators and for OSS and BSS providers. The biggest challenge, of course, is this, right? User control. I mean, it's mind-boggling how much control users want, what they want to see, how much empowerment they want. This is great for us as consumers, but it's a pain for providers. Right? I mean, the stuff that people are expecting from anything if you look at, for example, the music business now, it's all over the top streaming like Simfy or Spotify. Right? People are expecting 18 million songs for $10 a month. Right? And they're expecting that to go across all platforms. 
Then you have speed, you know, the warp drive. You don't have time to respond. I mean, it's all real time. Like all customer service now for major airlines is done on Twitter. Right? You have a problem with Turkish Airlines, you tweet. You get an instant response, right? It's real time. And this, security. Eh? Data security, cloud computing. When our entire life moves into the cloud, if we don't have security, we don't have management of data, we don't have standards, we're screwed, right? Because that is the worst case scenario. Your health records, your banking, your information, your shopping, your car travel, everything in the cloud, but it's not secure. Like we heard last year, the summer of Snowden, eh, NSA. That's, that's a bad thing. I mean, there are an estimated $28 billion lost in the US economy because of NSA Snowden affair and the insecurity over cloud computing. In Switzerland, where I live, 45 companies have been started to offer Swiss cloud computing under Swiss law as a result of this whole discussion. So security is crucial. And here's a great quote from Peter Drucker, management guru, who has some of the greatest book in this business. He, he wrote, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence and change itself, but to act with yesterday's logic. And I tell you, because I've been doing this now for 10 years, mobile operators and telecoms love to act with yesterday's logic because it's safe. But I'm here to tell you that if you act safe and you don't take a risk, it's actually very unsafe. It was safe until now. But now you have things happening that require us to think and take more risks. My friend Simon Torrens from Telco 2.0 has calculated the brutal decline in core revenue for European telecoms, and I'm sure this is not news to you. In developing countries, it looks better. But mobile operators are heading towards a total business model reboot. I know you've heard this before, but it's finally true because the convergence of technology has brought this to us. The tough mission, if you're in this business, redefining ROI. So forget about return on investment for a second. It's return on involvement. How involved are your customers, your partners, other companies and the business around you and the ecosystem. And this is, of course, the Google mantra, right? And the Facebook mantra. That's how they build their business. Right? They invest to get people involved. Don't tell your CFO. Right? You'll not be happy with that. But just like this little clip, which is taken from Tiffany Schlein's movie, it's all about interdependence now. In the future, you'll be working with publishers, with content companies, with health companies, with startups, with technology providers as a default. And of course, you know this, that industry definitions and borders are dissolving. I mean, see what just recently happened. Google Wallet, right? Google has a banking license. Facebook has a banking license. Amazon wants to send drones to deliver books and services. Right? Facebook is getting into money. Apple is becoming a bank. Industry barriers are dissolving. You stay in your own industry, that's all you do, then everybody will dissolve around you. Right? And it's going to leave you behind. So, great book by my friend Rita McGrath at Columbia. It's called The End of Competitive Advantage. You have to read this book because that's where you are. Right? You're at the end of this big competitive advantage. And that's good news, it's not bad news. This is a great book because she says, basically, we don't have to think about industry any longer. We think about the arena, you know, what is around us. What is the arena of Google? Well, operating system, health, money, software, right? artificial intelligence, search, advertising, cars, house, thermostats, right? And it's like everything. We very soon will live in the Google OS. So your most serious competition for what you do, whether you do software or actually mobile operations, will come from outsiders. The biggest competitor to hotels is this company called Airbnb. 
right, where you can rent places from each other. Try it out. I've tried it out five times. You know, to two of them were a total disaster, and two of them were good. And the other one I don't mention. Twitter is competing with CNN. Right? Twitter is now Twitter News Network, TNN. Right? And if, if CNN wasn't using Twitter, it would be irrelevant, basically. I mean, people keep telling me the best thing about CNN is, is Twitter that they use on the show. So this is what's happening everywhere in education and transportation. And you can expect increasing disruption coming through the back door, not through the front door. Airbnb didn't go to the hotels and said, can we make you superfluous? Right? Can we kill your business? They came to the back door by going through 60% unused property in each city, which people are just not using. Right? Mind-boggling. It's all about fancy places and different kinds of places and trust. Trusting strangers. So no, no surprise to you, startups are looking at the telecom sector. And when I say startups, I don't mean three or four. I'm talking about thousands. Thousands. Of course, you know that yourself, because now the cost of doing a startup is going towards zero. When I did my internet startups, it cost us $2 million to build a website. Now we can use a bunch of WordPress plugins to do the same thing. Great saying from this guy, David Rose, he says, any company designed for success in the 20th century is doomed to fail in the 21st. I don't agree on that dramatic position, right? But it, it rattles the brain when you think about who you have to be in the 21st century. Here are some of the startups. Right? You go to this website called angel.co, where you can see how many companies got funded. Right? The number yesterday was 6,177 companies in the area of mobile software and all of the terms that we're in here. 6,177 funded. Right? So it's crucial to look at this. You know, sometimes the assets of the past become the death wish of tomorrow. Of course, a, a mobile network is not a dead asset, right? <laughs> but it leads you into a certain direction of thinking. Right? And that's still going to be ultimately very important. But look at this, what's happening, for example, in book publishing. The French company Hachette, with a nice, a nice office building, and now this is no longer needed because books are becoming e-books. Right? You don't print anymore. And their business model is radically changing. So the switch from the long-term competitive advantages, a great network, great technology, great infrastructure, great software, yes, but what is the future is what's been referred to as a transient advantage. You know, that's an advantage you use as long as it goes. You get ready for the next one, you run the next one. Compare Barnes & Noble bookstore with what Amazon is doing, right? Amazon robot shipping, right? using robots to ship stuff, drones for delivery, and of course mobile devices around the world. Okay, so let's do another poll because you did so good on the last one. I have to switch this on though first. You can take a look at this. The question is really quite simple and you can vote twice now. That's empowering, isn't it? Uh, so you can tell me what is the most powerful new opportunities for mobile operators in the U uh, that you're in. Let me switch. I have to switch this on first before you can actually do this. So just one second. I think we're still on the old one here. I do hope that the internet is working. Yes, yes, we are successful. This is still pretty much the worldwide wait, right? Okay. Okay, it should be live now. Are you getting something? Okay. Let me see if I can actually show the question again here. We may have to pay extra to get the whole page to load. Okay. Well, you can start voting if it's working. Obviously, you're better connected than I am, so we can actually see the results. Hello. 
Okay, the question is really simple. W which one of those opportunities are the most powerful? And then there's a list of, of options. Here we are, better late than never. Okay, so you can say it's content, it's money, it's health, it's big data. And let's just stick with what we do now. Who are the three people who voted for this? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Let me get my gun out here. But no. Okay, very interesting. So we got a pretty good s spread here. If you want to comment why you voted, let's stick with what we have, please feel free. Okay, good, good. You voted on this. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I have an answer on this is the, you know, there's lots of companies in print and media who are saying that if you put a paywall, you can make money charging people visiting the website, right? Did you know that the only paywall that is actually working is the Wall Street Journal, right? and the Financial Times also. That's it. Okay. New York Times, disaster. Okay. So you can say, I mean, the argument would be the same. You can do it, but very rarely it would work out, is my point of view. It's just like the paywall. You can do a paywall, but to say that the paywall is, is a, a solution to a, to a publisher uh, would probably bark up the wrong tree. I mean, we have an interesting scenario here, so very good to see this. Content, money, big data. And I have to say, I agree with you. I think, I think e-health and medical is also very interesting, but it's very early for this. Right? I mean, business intelligence, business services, big data, right? clearly. And I forgot to actually put in the Internet of Things, you know, which I would bundle in general in that direction, right? and content and media. Very good. We should discuss what exactly this means, but I don't know how much time I have left. Do I have time left? Is anybody watching the time? Is, no? Okay, then we'll go back to here. All right, so the military has a term that fits our situation, right? It's referred to as VUCA. Okay. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And that is the reality of providing communication services these days, right? As I'm sure you can agree, right? And this is true. So what is the response to this? And I think what we need to do is we need to th think about how we can actually, what I call, flip the VUCA, you know, create a different kind of VUCA. And there will be velocity, which is speed, right? To be fast. Unorthodoxy. Okay. Cook up new ideas. Reliance Entertainment, uh, two years ago in India, they actually said, you can use us to do Facebook and to do WhatsApp. You need us, right? They came in from the other end they offered a special deal to actually go and use WhatsApp and Facebook rather than charge extra for this. Collaboration and good American word, awesomeness. Yeah. Right, that's, that's America. Yeah, it's hard to translate what that is. Right? But awesomeness, for example, is something like Amazon launches a movie service called Amazon Unlimited. Right? And what they do when they launch it, they don't come out and say, now we can rent movies on Amazon. You know what they say? They say all of the premium customers, 75 million, get 50,000 movies for free. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Because you know what? They have already licensed the movies. Doesn't cost them any extra. But they're not trying to sell me something. They're giving me a present. Dropbox, you guys use Dropbox, yeah? Gives you a present for each person that you connect to Dropbox. And the other day, because I talk a lot about Dropbox, right? They said, Gert, uh, we like you. Here's 10 times as much storage for free. Right? It's a present. That's awesome. Right? It's easier to do for them than for many others, clearly. Uh, but 
And the Internet of Things is one of those awesome things. And I think what's happening here that we can say the Internet of Things could be heaven or it could be hell, depending how you look at it. And, and, and this is the challenge, for example, with big data is the same thing. It can be fantastic to be this intelligent, but to know everything and to be able to use that everywhere can be rather scary. Right? You can have huge privacy issues. And so it's a bit of a hell van scenario. Imagine a world where all the cars are connected. The benefit of that is clear, but would you want the police to know everywhere you drove for the last seven years? That could be hell. It could be heaven for other reasons, but hell for others. All of the home connect, I mean, this is where we're going, right? Regardless of what we want, this is going to happen. Right? Because technology makes it possible. You know, I'm one of those sensors now costing something like 0 0.4 cent. They used to be $500. Right? So, I mean, clearly this is the future we're going into. We're going into this opportunity of convergence of cyberspace, you know, online, and meat space, which is, you know, us called meat space. Right? Uh, for example, this, this thing called Uber, you guys know Uber, right? a taxi company? I use all the time, you can call a taxi through an app. It's a private driver essentially. You can buy, in, in many cities you can buy their services. This only works because of mobile technology. And now there's the first mobile companies who are using this, for example Verizon. Right? Verizon just launched a car sharing service. And it, I think it's called uh, auto, auto car, or what is it called again? Uh, auto share, yeah. A little bit confusing name. You know what Verizon did? They're not a car company. They said, you can rent out your own car by using the Verizon app. You put a sticker on your car with a QR code. Somebody walks up and wants to rent your car. If they're signed up, they can unlock the car with the app and pay you and drive away with your car a car sharing thing that was rolled out in a couple of weeks. I mean, pretty amazing scenario for a mobile operator to get into the car sharing business. Did it take a lot of technology? Not really. Okay. And I, then we have this whole trend on what's happening with artificial intelligence I mentioned before. You have to watch this trend because that is the future of software. That's a scary thought that all of the internet companies are investing Every single company in artificial intelligence has been purchased by Facebook, Google, IBM, Microsoft, or others right? to take care of the heavy lifting that used to require thousands of people. For example, in the, in the future, a call center, customer service, machines. Right? Can a machine respond when I'm saying, you know, I'm pissed off about my flight delay? Can, machines can do that pretty well now, actually. Right? They're not human, but you know, they, they work tiredly forever. <laughs> you don't have to pay them. Right, so this is clearly going to happen in this regard. And now data is essentially becoming the main driver of this. Right? I mean, it's mind-boggling to see this app called Google Now. If you look at this, you see in the future of customer service. Big data has been described many times, but you know, this is why I'm happy you voted like you did. I mean, the map of big data, McKinsey is saying we're looking at roughly $7.5 trillion a year in revenue streams from big data by 2020. Bigger than the oil business. So it's very, very powerful stuff. Everyone and everything is becoming a source of data. Now there is a scary thought, but it's also a powerful thought. Could be heaven, could be hell. This cartoon says, 1993, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, 1993. And 2013, on the internet, everybody knows you're a dog. Right? There, there's the difference. Right? The internet has gotten a lot smarter. And uh, Cognizant has an interesting video. They call this idea the, the code halo. Every person has like an information halo around them. Right? And they're actually quite serious about this. <laughs> They have a book called The Code Halo. Right? That you should read this. It's funny and serious at the same time. But every person has this, uh, this concept of being surrounded by data, right? Clearly a very powerful concept, but also some very potential you know, unintended consequences that could come out of this. Right? Super intelligence. Right? Seeing all the way through. I think this is an illusion. You know, we're, we're never going to see all the way through, but we're going to see better. Right? 
So I, usually what happens when you run a business, you can see this far, right? And that's it. And that's not good. Because right? all the friction that you have not making decisions and stuff, I'd be happy to look you know, up to here uh, in the future. I think that is more realistic. And as I said before, part of this problem that you have to avoid at all costs is to abuse people's data. Right? Yes, we scan. Not a good idea. Right? Because in the end, you're in this business, right? You're in the technology business, but the flip side of technology is trust. Right? You break the trust with your customers, and you're, then you're finished. Right? So this is a very important thing to remember. You have to avoid this kind of big data disaster. You know, for example, data going out where it's not supposed to go, or the wrong API connecting to the wrong people, and things like that. Right? Uh, you want to avoid this at all costs. You want to avoid big data should not be big brother. Right? Nobody wants that. Not a good business model to make big data big brother. Right? People will not con uh, comply with this. Right? So cyber crime, of course, there's people saying that 50% of all military spending in the next five years will be cyber crime and cloud computing. 50% military spending. No more soldiers, all in the cloud, right? Soldiers in the cloud, so to speak. And of course, cloud security becomes mission critical. We've discussed this earlier. You can see already what happened with the NSA revelations, how much money was lost as a, as a consequence. So this is really quite serious. Let me do a quick summary, and then I'm off the stage. Point one, technology is changing our world exponentially. You don't have time to wait. Exponential means that while we're waiting, the world has doubled in output. And Moore's law is 18 months. Now, the fact is every 12 months, we're getting major innovations in technology and culturally that are changing the way that we do business. It is very likely that by 2020, sometimes half of your business comes from new revenue streams. What are they? You have to figure out what they are. Mobile services pie is likely to be much larger. I call this telemedia. If you want to know more about my concept of telemedia, just go to YouTube and put in telemedia. Lots of videos on this. Industries are converging. Whether we like this or not, right? I mean, if you're in the publishing business, you don't like Google to be in the publishing business. You don't like Amazon to be in the book business. But that is what's happening. Right? So mobile platforms, mobile operators become platforms. Platforms for other business concepts. Digitally contestable businesses, we need to try and flip the VUCA, right, to be quick, to be unorthodox, to collaborate, and to be awesome. Right. We need liquid and digital native business models, things that only work because people are connected. Right. Lots of examples. All the top 20 companies, you know, Airbnb is worth twice as much as the higher hotel chain. Right. I mean, a company that's two years old, renting other people's rooms, is worth more than the Hyatt hotel chain by two times. So this is moving very quickly. Automation, artificial intelligence are certain. I mean, if you're in the software business, this, this is where everything is going. Right? So get ready for some serious competition there. Very important. All the startups I listed earlier, you have to engage with those startups. You can import innovation. You can import transformation. That's all they want to do is connect to large players. Right? Security standards and digital trust become mission critical. I mean, if you're in the risk business, you're actually moving center stage now. Right? But this is going to be much larger than just figuring out the business risk. Right? It's going to be much larger about security and standards. So to sum up, right, the best way to predict the future is to create it. That's what Peter Drucker said. So that's what I wish for you. Thanks very much for listening. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. <laughs>